Good evening, St. Matthew. Good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? I'm so glad to be with you tonight for Wednesdays in the Word. Wednesdays in the Word. Uh, we want to start off with a short word of prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for the opportunity that we have right now to come before you to learn more about you, to study more about you, to study to show ourselves approved, to work in the need and not be ashamed. Lord, we ask that you guide our words and guide our thoughts and strengthen us as we study more about what you have asked us to do. And even in this lesson, God, we want to know and we want to understand that we have liberty in Christ Jesus through his ultimate sacrifice, oh God. We'd also like to lift up those on our sick and shut-in list and those in bereavement. We'd also like to send a special prayer out to the family of Brother Barn, uh, Brown that just passed away, Lord. Continue to strengthen them and guide them and lead them in the way that you would go as they seek to honor him later on this week. These and all other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so tonight, 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 we are going to be talking about liberty in Christ. And if you look in the description box, there is a slideshow that I have prepared if you want to look at it later, that's fine. If you want to pull it up now, I am going to also put in the broadcast so you can see it. So you can save it for later, or you can just look on the screen right now. And I'm working on that now. All right. Let's make it up the slideshow. There we go. Liberty in Christ. So if you have your Bibles, I hope that you do. Let's go ahead and go to Galatians 5 and 1. Galatians 5 and 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. That is the New King James Version. For those that read the King James Version, the scripture, I'll go to and read it. 5 and 1, the King James Version. Stand fast, therefore, in liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All right. Truth is the equivalence of freedom. Truth is the equivalence of freedom. As we discover the truth about what Christ did for us on Calvary, we can begin to enjoy the freedom that he has provided. Truth is the equivalence. That means it is the same as freedom. Truth and freedom go together. As we discover the truth about what Christ did for us on Calvary, we can begin to enjoy the freedom that he has provided to us. This is the Lenten season. We talked about this when I taught a couple weeks ago. The Lenten season is focused around the final days before he was placed on the cross, okay? And that is what we are celebrating. This is the period of time that we are in right now, okay? Freedom is not gained by having it our way or doing it however we want to do, or doing it your way. This is not Burger King. You cannot have it your way. Even doing whatever I please, whenever I please, that's, that, that's not freedom. The world would have you to believe that you are free to do whatever you want to, however you want to, whenever you want to. And I'm here to tell you, that's not true freedom. That is not true freedom. Because in that carelessness of doing whatever you want to, however you want to, whenever you want to, and letting it all hang out, you forfeit. You forfeit your freedom. In other words, you are choosing bondage to your own sinful nature. Remember, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Also remember that even on our best days, we are filthy rags. Also remember that we were formed in sin, shaping iniquity. Remember all those good scriptures that we like to recall? Let's think about those. So when you act carelessly and you want to operate in your own freedom, that means you are choosing God's nature. You are choosing your sinful nature over God's way and his nature. 
And so then you're putting yourself basically back in slavery. So our today three, the today's three that we're going to talk about. We want to acknowledge the gospel that has brought liberty to us. We want to remember that Christ placed us in a state of liberty. So we are free. And then lastly, we want to stand fast in that liberty. So let's talk about Paul's argument in Galatians. Paul wrote this book to the people in Galatia. His argument was that under the gospel, we are brought to liberty from the yoke of ceremonial law and the curse of moral law. The yoke of ceremonial law and the curse of moral law. So what is ceremonial law? Let's talk about this. Okay, so ceremonial law is a law that prescribes the ceremonies of a religion as of those in the Jewish religion contained in the Old Testament. That is ceremonial law. Ceremonial laws are called hukam or chukka in Hebrew, which literally means the customs of the nation. So that is the things that they do in that particular nation, and they're called statutes, okay? These laws focus on the inherent attention of God, and they include instructions on regaining a right standing or righteousness with God. So those are the sacrifices that they would give and also the other ceremonies ceremonies that they would help to get themselves from being unclean. So if they touched a dead body, they had to go and they had to do this statue or ceremonial law to get them back themselves back in right standing. If they stole from a neighbor, okay, they would have to go through that, that statute again or that huckam in order to get themselves back in right standing. That is ceremonial law. That is ceremonial law. And that is the remembrance of God's work in Israel. And also they have feasts and festivals. That's the second part of it. So once again, ceremonial laws are laws prescribing the ceremonies of religion in that particular faith in the Jewish religion. OK, and they are contained in the Old Testament. OK, and those are also statutes, sacrifices, festivals and different laws that they had to perform in order to get themselves back in right standing with God ceremonial law. Okay. They also are signs that point to the coming Messiah as well, such as Sabbath, circumcision, the Passover, and the redemption of the firstborn. You're, we're thinking about the plagues now. Okay. Now, some Jews believe that the ceremonial law is not fixed. They hold fast, and these are some modern day Jewish thinkers, that they change or they evolve as the times go by. Some people are strict traditionalist Jewish, and then some people believe that just like in the process of sanctification, that they are supposed to evolve with the times, okay? So Christians are not bound by ceremonial law because the church is not considered the nation of Israel, okay? Be very clear. Those festivals are memorial festivals such as the, the Festival of Weeks, the Passover, um, the, the Feast of the Tabernacles, different things like that. We are not hold to that. We're not held to that standard to fulfill those particular festivals. OK, if you want to look and I'm going to go forward in my slide just a little bit at the bottom of this next slide that I went to Galatians 3, 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law and kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So that is the reason why the laws of Moses were put into place to bring us to Christ. Okay. So that is the reason why we, that's the reason why Jesus came. And that's the reason why we do not hold fast to those particular ceremonial laws. Okay. Now you would, they, some also, I do have down here, some also hold fast to the 10 commandments, give weight, give the weight of the moral law. And it says that, um, let's see, others quote Colossians 2, 6, um, 2, 16 and 17 and Romans 14 and 5 to also explain that Jesus has fulfilled the Sabbath and become our Sabbath rest. So we we honor Sabbath, okay, at St. Matthew, because we go to we go to church every Sunday and honor the Sabbath, okay, because they were they were talking specifically with the third commandment, um, the which is to keep the Sabbath day holy, okay. But that's for another conversation. I really don't want to get into that because that will confuse y'all a little bit. But um, you have to be, as in Romans 14 and 5, be convinced in your own mind 
that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and he came to save you. But we'll just go off into that. We'll talk about that later. Now, what is the curse of the moral law? Okay, let's talk about moral law now. We talked about ceremonial law, which are the, the laws prescribing the ceremonies of religion. Now, the moral law on the flip side, that relates to justice and judgment and are often translated as ordinances. Okay, flash fact. What are the two ordinances that we as Baptists um, practice or that we observe? I'm not going to wait for y'all to answer that because y'all not here. The two ordinances that we observe are baptism and the Lord's Supper. If you learn nothing else from tonight, please be able to tell me what the two ordinances are that we, we observe. It's baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is for regeneration. The Lord's Supper is to remember that we are justified by faith. Those are the two things. That is, to, that is the practice that we do in order to remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ concerning us being justified to be back in the fold and be in right standing or in righteousness with uh, God. Okay. That's our link. So ordinances, moral law, those are holy, just, and unchanging. Okay. Their purpose is to promote the welfare of those who obey them. The value of the law is considered by obvious reason and common sense. Okay. So here's where we, we have a, we have a pen mark. The curse of the moral law is you are to have a certain standard, right? So people say, I'm very moral. I am going to heaven. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The only way you're going to heaven is by what? Accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? I talk about this right now. I said, Paul argued how contrary the principles and the spirit of the Judaizers were to the spirit of the gospel. The gospel. Who knows what the gospel is? People talk about the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ? I would give you a chance to answer, but since you can't answer, I'm going to say this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is Jesus' life, death, his burial, and his resurrection. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't believe all four of those things, you don't believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all or none. It's all or none. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, the moral law encompasses the regulations on justice, respect, sexual conduct includes the Ten Commandments and also includes the penalty for failure to obey the ordinances. Moral law does not point people to Christ. It merely illuminates the fallen state of mankind. That's why I say moral law does not get you into heaven. It doesn't get you to Christ. It just simply points out that we are all sinners, okay? And it all shows that we have, we have all fallen away from Christ. And it shows the necessity of needing Christ. So if you fail moral law in the world of, of today, okay, that means that you are immoral. But that does not necessarily mean that you are not righteous. It just depends, okay? Because everybody sins, okay? I'm not saying to use that as a crutch either. But in your sin, you have recompense. You have someone that will go in your stead which is Jesus Christ, which says it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't point you to Christ. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you that, 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 that it shows you the necessity of Christ, not to point you towards Christ. Okay. Now, modern Protestants are divided over the application of the moral law or the mishpatim. It's called mishpatim, mishpatim. Okay. They are, however, to understand that Jesus fulfilled the requirement. You can find it in Matthew 5 and 17. And that we are instead under the law of Christ, which is in Galatians 6, 2, which is in the next book. If you like me, I like to read what's before and what's after. So in Galatians 6, 2, it says we should love God and we should love others. OK. OK. Many of the moral laws of the Old Testament give excellent examples on how to love God and how to love others and how we can have freedom from the law. And but wait a minute. But. We have freedom from the moral law, but it's not a license to sin. It's absolutely positively doesn't mean that you can go around sin and saying, well, God don't forgive me. Or our favorite line as Christians, ah, God knows my heart. Yes, he does know your heart. He knows you're sinful and he knows you meant to do whatever it is that you did before you said God knows my heart. OK, now it's not a license to sin. You can find it in Romans 6, 15. OK, OK. We are not specifically bound by Mishpatim. However, 
it is to show us the need for Christ. Okay? Now, let's move on. Attempting to keep the law would only bring or earn us death. Paul talks about that as well. He says, because no matter how much we try to do right, we still going to do wrong. And we would constantly be doing sacrifices as they did in the Old Testament. They was always running around looking for the firstborn calf to slaughter because they was always messing up. They was always out of money because they were always messing up. And if you were a true um, Israelite, you always was messing up. It was always a sacrifice. Every single year, you had to go in and pray for those that you actually got over on and then the, the, purposefully and then the people that you didn't get over on, you know, that on purpose, you know, that you accidentally got over on it. You had to, you had to sacrifice. They had to clear out all the stuff every 10 years. There's so many different things that they used to do. We are too unjust to keep the law. Just know that. So no matter what you do, no matter what you say on your own, on your own um, reconnaissance, you cannot do anything to save yourself. That's the biggest thing. That is the biggest thing. Next thing. So we're going to go back to my today's three. Acknowledge the gospel brought liberty to us. Acknowledge the gospel brought liberty to us. That's the first point. Justification. Zyokaos. Zykaos. Zykaosis. <laughs> Zykaosis. Or just, just a physical. I cannot get these words out today. In Christian theology, it is the act by which God moves a willing person from the state of sin or injustice to a state of grace or justice. Okay, that's justification. The act by which God moves a willing person from the state of sin, injustice, to the state of grace, which is justice. Okay, it also means the change in a person's condition from moving from a state of sin to a state of righteousness, okay? And then lastly, it is the act of acquittal by where God justifies or gives contrite sinners the state, the status of righteousness, okay? So it's an acquittal. It is a legal term, okay? Justification is acquittal that is injustice to justice and moving from sin to righteousness, okay? Y'all got it? So he is acquitting us from sin, he is putting us in a state of righteousness and he is taking the injustice away from us that we are inherently brought by our sinful nature and putting us into a state of grace or justice. OK, justification happens through Jesus Christ alone. Justification, justification or acquittal from sin or forgiveness of sin or removal of sin only happens by faith in Christ Jesus not by the righteousness of the law, which is why I told you in the previous slide that it removes us from the yoke of ceremonial law because ceremonial law will have you bound and you can't get on the kingdom building if you're trying to figure out how to get the sacrifice ready, okay? Romans 4.24, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses, and was raised because of our justification. So because of our acquittal, when we believe in Christ and the fact that he was raised from the dead, he was delivered up, he was delivered up because of our offenses and he was raised because we were acquitted, okay? So it is because we are acquitted, that is why, G why God raised him up. He was our sacrifice, okay? There had to be a sacrifice. Which is why, which is why we were delivered from that yoke or the burden of ceremonial law. He was the ceremonial law. I talked about that before too as well. That is the reason why he had to be a sacrifice. That is the reason why he had to be slaughtered. Okay? Because there had to be a sacrifice for the sin that we inherently had. That is the only way to get us back in right standing. That was ceremonial law literally illustrated in the in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? A person stands before God, not as righteous, but as a sinner, entirely dependent on this grace or this justice for the sin, which Jesus Christ actually put bore on his shoulders, okay? The law of Moses is no longer in force or was in force, and we talked about that in Galatians 3, 23, and 24, okay? 
the law of Moses was given to restrain the Israelites specifically from transgressions, make them sensible in their sins, and to lead them to Christ for justification. All who believe in Christ and the promises of God through him are the seed of Abraham, for whom God in the covenant promised to justify by faith. The Abrahamic covenant could not be annulled by the law of Moses. Okay, what did that mean? Wow, that was too much. The Abrahamic covenant, remember, it was by faith that God told Abraham he would number his seed as the stars. He gave him that covenant that if they believed on him and they trusted him and, and Abraham trusted him, that he would bless his seed. That is the Abrahamic covenant. The law of Moses cannot supersede that promise. You don't believe me? That is the reason why I put down Hebrews 11. That is to go down the line and the lineage of faith and why faith is so important in this. Because without faith, it is number one, impossible to please God. However, without faith, we cannot, we cannot, um, we cannot inherit, we cannot inherit the um, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Okay, that was a lie. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Okay, but faith is what bridges the gap between our injustice and our state of sinfulness versus our state of grace and and our justification. Okay. All right. So slide one. We have to acknowledge the gospel, which is Christ. Life, death, burial, and resurrection. That brought us freedom or liberty. Okay. Step one. Let's go to two. Christ placed in us a state of liberty so we are free. Let's talk about this yoke. Remember the scripture? Let's go back to Galatians 5.1. Stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke, okay, a yoke of bondage, yoke of bondage. Let's talk about this. So what's a yoke? A yoke is when we are forced to live in a difficult, unhappy state because of that thing or person that has us bound. Okay. That is what a yoke is. We put yokes on oxen to make them steer and to be guided. You got to think about it like this. The sin that binds us up causes us to do things that we do not want to do if we are Christians, okay? The things that we want to do, as Paul said, we do. The things that we don't want to do, as Paul says, we choose to do. That's because of the yoke that we have on us because of our sinful nature, right? But it is through Christ Jesus that we are made more than conquerors and we are able to overcome those things that bind us, okay? All true Christians being taught by the Holy Spirit wait for eternal life, the reward of righteousness, and the object of their hope as the gift of God by faith in Christ and not for the sake of their own works. Okay. So, you know, the scripture where they say it's not going to be my works. That's going to get me into heaven. This is what we're talking about. True faith is a working grace. Okay. True faith works with us. True, way, true faith works through us. It's a tongue tire, but it's the reason for this. True faith is a working grace. Every single day we need God's grace. It just doesn't sit on the shelf. So when we get saved, we just don't put it on. The, we just don't put it on like a coat and button it up. And then we just say, no, ma'am, no, sir. We have to constantly work at this thing called faith. OK, because every single day there's something that pulls on us to try to pull us back to the state that we were previously in. Right. What a temptation. What a temptation. That's the devil trying to pull us back in to what we used to be because he doesn't want anybody to be saved. Remember, he doesn't want anybody to be saved. So that's why we go through the things that we go through. We go through those things because the devil don't want us to be saved. He doesn't want us to be saved. He wants us to die just like everybody else. But God loved us so much. He said, no, that's not my intention. My intention is for y'all to be joined back with me. So let me just go ahead and send my son down so that y'all can be saved. OK, so it's a working grace. It is works by love to God and to our brethren, okay? Now, you have to show love. So it's not the physical, I'm going to do all these things and I'm saved now. It's by showing love and accepting the love of God through Jesus Christ. And because you love Jesus Christ, then in turn, you can love God. But then, wait a minute, how can you even get to love Jesus Christ if you don't love your brother? And Jesus Christ said that too. How can you love that which you have not seen and hate the thing that you can see. That's silly. That's really silly. And, and that's how I feel. You know, 
you have to you have to really understand what that means. It sounds insane. You you love and you believe in something that you've never seen before. But you can see the other person and you can exude and you can exemplify and you can show them how to love by just loving them first, even if they hate you. Because the word of God even says that too. It's easy to trust and to love those who love you back. But the true testament is in loving those that hate you and those that would despitefully use you. That's where it shows the true act of faith because you have to trust in God that he will be El Jemuel, which is the God of recompense, that he will fight for you and he will stand in your stead and you don't have to avenge yourself for he avenges you. Okay? You, you got to understand this thing. You got to believe enough in God that if you do the right thing by, by, you have to believe enough in God and you have to trust God enough to believe that even when things come up against you, that he's going to protect you and he's going to save you. And that he's going to block those things away from you. That's what true faith is. That's what true faith is. Being able to trust God enough to know that he's going to take care of you while you're loving your brother. Even though you know that they may not love you back the way that you want to be loved. That's true love. Now, without faith working by love, all else is worthless. And compared to other things, it is of small value. It is of small value. Faith working by love. Everything else is worthless. If you ain't loving somebody, you ain't doing nothing because money ain't got nothing to do with it. And then, you know, Tina Turner will say, well, what's love got to do with it? It's got everything, everything to do with it, everything to do with it. Let's talk about Eleutheros, 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 to liberate or to exempt. We don't have to be in the sin that we were shaping in anymore by accepting Jesus Christ's gift of eternal life. He has liberated us or he has exempted us from the sin that we now live in. If we're living in Christ, we are exempt from sin. I'm not saying that we will not sin, but what I'm saying is we are exempt from the penalties of sin. There is a key there. We are exempt from the penalties of sin. So we don't have to be in the sin that we were shaping in anymore. We don't have to wallow in it. We don't have to say, woe is me, I'm going to die because I'm so sinful and, and God don't love a sinner. We don't have to do none of that stuff. We don't have to do none of that stuff. So let's talk about this. Last point. First point, acknowledge the sin. I'm sorry, acknowledge the gospel brought to us, brought to liberty. I'm sorry, acknowledge the gospel brought liberty to us. Number two, Christ placed us in a state of liberty so we are free. And last, we need to stand fast in that liberty. How do we do that? Vocabulary, okay? Vocation and victory. Vocabulary, vocation, and victory. Vocabulary. Change the way that you talk. That's how you stand in liberty. Change the way that you talk because I'm going to tell you something. When you speak, people say that you put stuff out into the atmosphere. You put stuff out into the into the into the um into the environment that you're in. You can speak life because every time you speak, you got to think about it like this. Not going to blow your mind right quick. When we were created in the garden, what, what happened to us? We were formed. But it wasn't until he breathed the life into our nostrils, into our being, that, we, that, that man became a living soul, right? So it's the words that come out of our mouth that speak life. The breath, the things that are coming out, the things that we are saying, that's what gives life to situations. And when the spirit of God lives in us, we can then speak life into other people. Or we can speak death. We can speak life into our situation or we can speak life, speak death over to our situation. So stop saying God knows my heart. Of course he knows your heart. That's why he knew that he had to send Jesus Christ. Of course he knows you're human. Of course he knows you're shaping iniquity. You have to start spitting out and regurgitating those words that speak life into your life. I know that I'm more than a conqueror. I know that God has given me life eternally. I know that he's going to be my shepherd. He has everything that I want. I know that he has came to justify me. You have to speak those scriptures that are embedded in you. Okay. And start saying that I can do all those things. I am that. I am what God says I am. I am a child of God. I, I do have eternal life. You have to speak those things. And I can't stand a person that uses a vocabulary. You ask them how they doing. They say, oh, I'm terrible. I'm so tired. I'm this, that, and the other. Well, then you're going to stay tired because you keep speaking tiredness into your life. You keep speaking sickness into your life. You, you keep speaking horrible things to happen in your life. 
things are not going to get better until you start saying they're better. OK, you can't be free from something until you say that you're free from that thing. So that's what I'm saying to you to you now. Your vocabulary helps you to speak that liberty and that freedom and that exemption from sin into your life. OK, let's talk about vocation. You have to persevere. You can't stand still and expect to go somewhere. OK, you'll catch that probably after Bible study, but you can't stay still to go somewhere. You got to turn the key on, turn the ignition on. You got to persevere through something. You're never going to get to the end of the race if you're standing still in the race. OK, the race is not given to the Swiss. I'm not saying run through to think that you're going to get past it. Be knowledgeable and walk through those individual steps of the whatever situation that you're in is what I'm saying. You keep pressing forward. He will keep walking with you. You stand still. He stands still. You stop working. He stops working. This is a what they call a symbiotic relationship. When you have a parasite that lives in your body, the only way to get rid of that parasite is to keep moving to get rid of that parasite. OK, you don't not do anything. So how do you expect for God to do something if you do nothing? You have to keep going in your vocation. You have to find yourself staying focused on kingdom building. And you have to start with yourself. Just like everybody's on live right now and listening to Bible study and they're going to meditate over this word and read these slides. I pray and hope that you do and understand what I'm saying to you right now. Find yourself focused on kingdom building. Find yourself residing in grace. Find yourself residing in love. Do something for somebody. Other than yourself and your people. Do something for somebody else. Give somebody something. There's no crime in giving somebody something. Because I guarantee you, a closed fist like this ain't going to get nothing in it. But if you give more, somebody's going to give something to you. And it may not come from the person that you gave to. So stop saying that I gave somebody a $100 bill and they were supposed to give me a $100 bill. Look for the blessing wherever God decides to give it to you from. And stop holding people to that standard of you give me some, I give you some. The only word that works with is Jesus Christ. You give God all and then he gives you a portion of it back. And he don't have to give it to you when you ask him for it. He'll give it to you when you need it. Okay. Last but not least, victory. You have to believe that you are a conqueror. You have to believe that you're a conqueror. Once more and again, in this scripture, it specifically says, be not and do not be entangled again. It says, do not be entangled again. Again means once more, furthermore, or on the other hand, realize that you are the opposite of dot, dot, dot. You are the opposite of what you used to be. You are the opposite. You are, you were then not saved. Now you are saved. You were once bound. Now you are free. You don't have to do those things. You have to realize your victory. That's how you stand fast in liberty to understand that you have overcome these things through Christ Jesus. You have overcome all of these things. So lastly, and not, not leastly, I don't think that's the same, but all I want you guys to do, I just really want you to remember this, that you can do all things, everything through Christ who strengthens you. If you remember nothing else, Philippians 4.13, remember you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Galatians, that's liberty in Christ. We have to stand there for in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. He has given us a state of freedom. And we are not to be entangled or to be caught up. We are exempt from that yoke of bondage. Don't go back to be bound. Stand in your liberty in Christ. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in tonight. I want you to be aware that we are... No, oh, I don't know what that came up for. I want you to be aware that we are going to stay and we are going to continue in prayer for the Brown family. Brother Brown was a, a pillar of St. Matthew. I can't say this enough. He loved us very dearly. He believed in worshiping Christ above all. I will always remember for him for keeping the, the spirit of God in the place, no matter what. I will I will always remember him for that. His funeral services will be this Saturday with the visitation at 10 a.m. And that will go from 10 until 11 a.m. And then the funeral service will follow thereafter. We want to celebrate him just like he celebrated Christ every day. He understood his liberty in Christ. I promise you he did. And he stood fast on that liberty in Christ. Amen. We'll pray us out. We also want to remember that 
Um, Pastor Little will be on tomorrow evening for Refill Thursdays at 7 p.m. We hope you all can join us then. And between now and then, I pray that God's blessings shine on you and his face um, to be gracious and he, and to love you and all those good things. I love you guys for real. Um, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this awesome Bible study to let us know that we are free in, in Christ Jesus, oh God. Let us not walk in that yoke of bondage that we were in before. Let us understand that we are now exempt from that sin and you have justified us by our faith, oh God. And true faith starts with loving each other. And then by loving each other, we can love you greater, oh God. Continue to bless every person on this live, every person under my voice, whether they hear me now or they hear me later, oh God. Allow them to let this word minister to their hearts and their minds and their souls, oh God. We pray that their evenings go bed well and that everything that they come home to is resolved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you guys. I will see you soon. If you're planning to celebrate the life of Brother Brown, I will see you on Saturday. If not, I will see you Sunday morning. God bless. Amen and amen. See you next week.